Okay, I'm Danielle, Danny. Um, I'm from the Chicago branch by way of Durham branch by way of Ghana. Um, and this is my fifth conference and I'm so excited that we are growing so much. Um, my talk's kind of similar to Monica's, but it's a lot more shit talking, so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. In the wake of Harvey Weinstein's exposure as Hollywood cisgender scum who sexually assaulted women for decades, victims have been speaking out about their experiences of sexual harassment and assault, noting the culture of silence and victim blaming that forces many survivors to live in the shame of their trauma. The social media campaign has been seen as a rallying cry for feminists and the continuous work that must be done to fight toxic masculinity. But the unfortunate reality of the movement is that it has been a space for white women only. The hashtag MeToo campaign was started 10 years ago as a nonprofit by Tarana Burke, a black woman. <laughs> a black woman wanting to support young women of color facing sexual trauma and harassment. As she noted once in an interview, sexual violence doesn't see race or class, but the response to it does. What this current surge of mass disclosure has proven once again is that our society only cares about victims if they are rich and white. That white privilege means that they can take a campaign created by a black woman, whitewash the fuck out of it, and throw the voices of black women and femmes away without remorse. Because what is continuously and intentionally left out not only from this campaign, but all conversations around victimization is the stories of black and brown, queer and trans violence from white men, white women, and white supremacy, and how all of this is inherently tied to capitalism. It is why these mainstream feminist movements are of no benefit to us. At its core, mainstream feminism is anti-black, anti-queer, and anti-trans, because it relies on the same oppressive principles found under capitalism in order to remain valid. We know, <laughs> we know this to be true when we look at the history of the women's movement. Um, the 1890s in the United States was dubbed the era of woman and seen as a pretty key time in, the de in defining the onset, onset of the women's movement. It was a time where middle-class white women were increasing their visibility in the public sphere to prove themselves capable of engaging in male-dominated spaces. They stood against social evolutionist theorists who maintained straight, white, cisgender manhood as superior. Those that supported the struggles of white women, such as with the women's suffrage movement, often linked this work to an evolutionary progress that posited the colonial capitalist United States as superior to the primitive cultures of Asia and Africa. These feminists appealed to the white male ruling class in a way that necessarily rejected blackness and queerness through, one, adhering to traditional gender norms as a way to preserve the white race, and two, emphasizing their differences from women of color in order to be in solidarity with white men. So this placing of black and queer trans, black, queer, and trans femmes as everything that is not white is an ongoing product of slavery and colonialism and something that we still see to this day. As black feminist thinker Patricia Hill Collins has said, white women's sexuality could not be constructed as it is without corresponding controlling images or stereotypes applied to US black women. And I also argue that this applies to black women in Africa and globally. We are ultimately not part of the category of woman or womanhood and therefore unable to claim palpable narratives of oppression because it was never meant to include us. And so these mainstream conversations and work around gender and sexual oppression is limited to the experiences of cisgender white women. For the past month and a half, black and dark-skinned women, dark-skinned New York strippers have been organizing a strike <laughs> Um, they've been organizing a strike, speaking out against racism and colorism in the industry. Some of their, some examples of the discrimination they've been facing include dark-skinned black women having consistent, 
have had consistent difficulty getting or keeping jobs because of the systemic preference to hire white and Latinx dancers. Um, Dark-skinned strippers are either not allowed to dance on high-earning nights or barred from VIP sections. And celebrity bartenders, which are often white or light-skinned, kind of Instagram famous, um, women with body types that are not only unrealistic, but rooted in anti-blackness, are, are brought into these clubs, earning money on the backs of black femmes and our labor. And I say our labor because as a sex worker, this issue of the strike, it's not just about, thank you, it's not just about strippers' rights and it's not just about the conditions that sex workers face, but it's specifically about dark-skinned women, dark-skinned black women, and, and femmes fighting the manifestations of anti-blackness in our sex work. Our voices and struggles are not part of mainstream feminist, the future is female bullshit, because at the, at the same time that white women are speaking out against cisgender, hetero, patriarchal violence, they are benefiting from the oppression of black femmes, especially do those of us that are dark-skinned, trans, and fat. What we need is a revolutionary socialist and revolutionary feminist movement that recognizes that the capitalist system encourages and benefits from every oppressive system. We must recognize that any form of work or activism that concedes to capitalist ideals, no matter how well-intentioned or intersectional or radical they claim to be, is fundamentally flawed because liberation will never be allowed to flourish under this system. The survival of the capitalist patriarchy is dependent upon our oppression. But under revolutionary feminism and socialism, the future will be queer, trans, and black. Thank you.